I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker today is Danny Walker. Danny worked for the Wyoming State Archaeologist Office from 1973 through 2015, retiring as the Wyoming Assistant State Archaeologist. He's been an adjunct faculty member of the Anthropology Department at the University of Wyoming since 1976. He's the author and co-author of more than 120 uh, research articles and seven books. Dr. Walker is a registered professional archaeologist and a member of the Society for American Archaeology, the Plains Anthropological Conference, the Wyoming Archaeological Society, the Wyoming Historical Society, and the Wyoming Association of Professional Archaeologists. Okay, I'm going to shorten this from what my normal talks are, but not talking about the historic record or anything. I'm just going to talk about the archaeology that I've been involved with since 2005. Um, it's all related, of course, to the Battle of Platte Bridge, but then also, the same day, the Battle of Red Buttes happened. Um, this is a painting by William Henry Jackson that was commissioned in the 1930s, depicting what the historians at that time felt happened at that battle. Um, you get the circle of wagons, you get the Indians running a big horse race around the outside, and eventually coming into the center, just like the old John Wayne movies. But what we know now, this is not what happened. Um, it's a lot more complicated than that. But in general, it ended up in the same thing with the uh, cavalry being completely wiped out. One of the controversies about the battlefield is the actual name itself. Um, when the early records were talking about it, Primarily, a lot of those historians at the time called it part of the Battle of Platte Bridge because that battle happened because of what was going on up at Red Butte's battlefield. And there's some controversy about why it's called Red Butte's because the geographic feature is completely out of sight about five miles away. But in the adjutant, adjutant general report of all the Kansas regiments that participated in the Civil War, which the 11th Kansas was, um, in that report published in 1896, Ellison quotes it in his 1924 paper as being the Battle of Red Buttes. There's some talk that Ellison was one that decided it should be called the Battle of Red Buttes with no explanation why, but there are earlier documents that already talk about it. And at one time, I actually saw something out of the correspondence of the, um, whatever it is, the Civil War, all the military letters that were sent and everything. One of the telegrams that was sent within two days of the battle also referred to it as the Battle of Red Buttes. I couldn't find that reference again to save my soul two days ago, but it is out there somewhere. So what we want to talk about is the Battle of Red Buttes. Okay, it's been searched for almost, well, well over 100 years now. Um, there was talk clear in the 1890s about trying to relocate it, um, but nothing was really done until the 1920s when things really started picking up on the search. And as you can see, there's quite a few of the longtime, well-known historians in Wyoming that have been looking for it. Um, some people a lot more detailed than others, but in a lot of ways, it's still unknown. I got involved with it at the invite of Steve Hack, who will be leading the next talk because in 2005, a major housing development is, was being proposed and actually construction started. And so, I don't think that, yeah, there's, there's the battlefield area right in here. And this is what it looked like in 2005. This is what it looks like in 2019, including all the new proposed area here, which has not been developed into housing yet. The black line is the separation of private land and the new preserve that the BLM. Sorry. We'll do it this way. 
I can't see two directions at once. Thank you. <laughs> but anyhow, the black line here is the dividing line, a property line between the new BLM preserve and the housing development. Okay, at development as well as the development of the uh, new bypass around Casper on the west side or south side really brought things to head because everybody was worried that, that people would just go ahead and if they saw something and when they're doing construction they would plow right through it and so we really needed to get involved with doing some detailed very specific searches for the project to try and locate first the battlefield and then the soldier's grave. In 2008, UW received funding from the Natona County Commission, and we went out and did some metal detecting as well as magnetometer studies. Each square here is a 100 meter square, with the smaller area here, those are 20 meter squares. And you can see the difference. The darker yellow was where we did metal detecting, as well as over here. And one of the main things we found, in fact, the only really thing that we found that year was in the area where we did the magnetometer work, right now visible on the surface is this one rut, trail rut right here, which is also the two-track road that the ranch still uses. But you can count eight different parallel tracks across there where the wagons were going up that slope to get over the hump to the west. Um, the other fun thing here is those all disappear right in this area and there's a nice logical reason for that because in the 1950s, 1960s, one of the people looking for it went in with a backhoe and just started backhoeing everything through here looking for the grave. And so definitely we know that is not the location of the lost grave. Um, so we really don't have to worry about that. This is the distribution of artifacts from 2008. And most of these are post 1860s. They're all 1880s, uh, 1890s. Uh, we did separate out the real modern stuff before I did this map, but for the most part, there's only about five or six artifacts in this map here that we could relate to the time period for the battle. 2012, we again received some money from the county commission and went back in with different magnetometers at the time and were able to run the magnetometers over a much larger area. Um, and just to put you in perspective, this is where Ellison and Mockler believes the battlefield was with the backhoe trenches running through here. Um, I can't even read this up here. Oh, okay. This is, these two, lo two locations up here are a couple of others that have been proposed. And then down here is the area that Steve Hack has proposed and has got some pretty good information that at least something was going on down here. Um, but you'll notice all of the speckles in through here, that's the magnetometer picking up metal artifacts. But in 2005 when I went out there, that area before the housing development started, that area was the unofficial town dump of South Casper. <laughs> there were refrigerators, there were oil barrels, there was everything laying out on the ground out there. And so uh, this area here, as far as the geophysics go, uh, we cannot look at any kind of period areas or features in that area at all because it's all covered by that modern trash. 2015, the NRCS and the city of Casper flew LIDAR, light detecting and ranging, and you can see where the housing development started in 2015. Most of it now is over in here. But the battlefield area is up in this area right in here. And what the LIDAR does is it basically gives you a picture of the ground surface and excludes all the vegetation uh, from your view. You don't see any grass out there, but you actually see what the ground surface looks like. 
and it but does pick up all the houses and that type of thing. The other thing LiDAR can do is you can do what they call line of sight. And what we did here, because there was talk that the army still at Platte Bridge uh, stood on top of the buildings and could see the battle, what we did is we did a line of sight with the LiDAR from that same point and extend it down across the battlefield, which would be right in here. And what you see in red is areas that you can actually see from the top of the re reconstructed barracks. The greens up here are cottonwood trees that grew up in the 20th century. And then, of course, here you start going down the back slope, coming up from Willow Springs. And so the area of the um, battle is right in here, completely visible to the people on top of the barracks. 2016, the Wyoming Cultural Trust Fund again gave us some money. And what the proposal there was, was while we did all this area in 2012, uh, following pretty much the trails, um, we left this wide open thing here. And the reason we did the trails in 2012 was because that's what all the historic records talk about. It's all, the battle's on the trail. It's on the trail. Well, which trail? This big flat area here hadn't been done, looked at before. So in 2016, we went in and did the magnetometer survey over this area. And basically, we've got a great big block here that we've now covered. These little squares right here, those are on about a 90, I shouldn't say 90, about a 70 degree slope. So definitely you would not have any remnants on those. Looking at it a different way, you got two colors of green here, light green and darker green. And here you can start seeing also speckles over here. Here's those old dump areas. But what these over here are, are uh, iron containing rocks in a Pleistocene sand deposit, which causes all types of problems with your magnetometer, but even more important with your metal detector if you're trying to locate individual artifacts laying out there. It's a little bit clearer here where you can really see the high purple. That's almost solid rock on the ground surface. So again, it's hiding the, um, what's under it, if there is anything under it, from view. In 2016, we ended up with a couple of major anomalies here and here. And so we got curious about them and did additional work on this area with metal detectors, uh, conductance meter, and um, mine's going, anyhow, neither one, of, none of them worked. <laughs> Ex except the metal detector, okay? This is the area we did with metal detector on a one meter transect. We laid ropes out to where the operators would literally swing their instruments between the two ropes, so we got almost 100% coverage. And at the time, we were thinking these two anomalies might be the location of two wagons. Based on my experience a couple years earlier, down at the Battle of Summit Springs in Colorado, where I was asked to go down and do some work, and we found similar looking anomalies down there. But when we uh, metal detected over those anomalies, there absolutely was nothing there, no metal artifacts. And so what we proposed here is those are the locations where the teepees were burned by the soldiers after the battle. It heated the soil up enough, it changed the magnetism and ended up with the signature of something highly magnetic. So that's what we were thinking on the Red Buttes area. And I went to town one morning with that in mind, I had to run some errands. And when I came back, I found out I was wrong because the guys had been metal detecting and they put out over 200 pin flags in about a 10 meter square area, each one signifying individual artifacts of some kind. So here's what it looks like. This is the concentration of all period artifacts in that area. And the only thing wrong with this picture is there's actually even more nails than what you see symbols for in these two areas right here. 
the uh, computer program, mapping program, just could not put that many dots in place. So then we look at the distribution of wagon parts. We've got two clusters, just like what showed up on the metal detecting. And then here's the bullet distribution. And then you look at wagon parts versus nails, and especially the horseshoe nails, you can see that that area was a place where a wagon had been and the mules. And that is part of the story, it is the 11th Cavalry were experienced soldiers from the Civil War, and they knew as a last resort, if they needed protection if, uh, by an opposing force, put your animals down and hide shoot from behind them. Immediate rest work. And so what we're proposing there is all those horseshoe nails are from where they put the mules down. The only problem with that is there's no horseshoes or mule shoes there. But at that time, mule shoes were very valuable out here and the relief party, the burial party, probably pulled them off the dead mules to reuse them because we've also got broken horseshoe nails. Some of the 2016 artifacts, primarily all wagon. Here's the horseshoe nails. Here's the fragments of the tips where they had clinched them over to hold the mule shoe on. And then cut nails probably came out of wooden boxes that were in the wagons. This is an interesting one here. We couldn't figure out what, ha what it was because we got brass rivets evenly spaced up and down through here. And my only regret is in 2008, I may have thrown another one of these away because uh, I thought it was a dog collar, modern dog collar. But after realizing what this one was, it's the bells off the bell mule, the leader lead mule, evenly spaced, Rivets with bells, like just like these sleigh bells here. The good news is that at the end of the 2016, um, as I say, all the earlier searches stayed on the main trail. They never got off of it because they read the reports as a fight being on the trail. And so it was good that they did that because we now have real good evidence that it wasn't on the main trail. That it wasn't? It was not on the main trail. So you've exhausted, yeah. you've exhausted the search there. Yeah, that, that's all down. Look, if you go on the trip tomorrow, you'll see the difference. Wow. The main trail is down on the flat ground. The battlefield is up on a rise, up on a ridge. Okay. okay? So 2019, we went back out again. When we did the 2016, we also saw these anomalies up here. So we thought they might also be the same thing as what we found in 2016. And they weren't. They were all a single artifact. But anyhow, we kept metal detecting. The red is what we did in 2016. The green is what we covered in 2019. And the gray is everything that we did the magnetometer survey over. And so you can see that for the most part, We've completely covered everything that doesn't have the iron cobbles on it. Very careful recording was done of every artifact found. Um, we used a total station, accurate to within a centimeter. And then if it was a projectile point, we would take orientation to try and figure out what direction that projectile, including both bullets and steel arrowheads, might have been shot from. The only problem is, is over half the bullets we found were ricochets, and once that happens, they just go in circles and you have no idea where they originated from. But we did find one mule shoe and one steel projectile point. And this is about 40, 50 meters away from what we found in 2016. We also found two more primer cap containers we found this one in 2016, or yeah, 2016. We found these in 2019. And down here at the bottom, you can see the little cap container in this reconstruction or reproduction pistol. 
led balls throughout the, all the years. Um, these go from the largest down to the smallest. And we're not sure, but what these might have been the muzzle loaders that the native soldiers were using. Um, some of the bottom might be coming from the soldiers' pistols. We don't know for sure what kind of pistol they were using, whether they were using real cartridges uh, with shaped bullets or they were all cap and ball. But it may be that they've got both of them because we did find some 32 caliber bullets and these up here are all faceted lead balls where it looks like they were shaved off a big uh, chunk of lead and then just put in the muzzle loader without being perfectly ground. They would still shoot good, but they wouldn't be as accurate. The 50 caliber bullets that we found are fairly extensive, scattered over the whole area. And these, as I say, these are all the 50 calibers. And every one of them are, appear to be the, um, there goes my brain again, Smith carbine bullet. 50 caliber Smith carbine is what the soldiers were using. Um, that carbine is a breech loader. The gun opens up on a swivel right at the breech. You put the paper cartridge in with the lead ball, close it back up, apply a primer cap, and then fire the gun. And so that was what they were doing at that time. This one up here was in 2008, and it was found over on the housing development area, and a real close examination of it shows that it, it had not been fired. It was from a bullet that was probably dropped by one of the outriders on the race to the river to get away from the attack. All the rest of these, of course, have been fired, as you can tell, by the ricochet appearance of them and everything else. So in total, at the end of 2016, here's our distribution of artifacts over this whole area here. That's all artifacts, all period artifacts. And again, there's overlap to where not all of the uh, circles represent a single artifact. Some of them may represent three or four artifacts. Looking at strictly the nails, again, this is that original two concentrations from 2012, or 2016 and then more scattered over, but not very many compared to that big concentration. We look at the weapon weaponry. You've got the steel point up here, come on, uh, steel point up here, and then separated up the lead balls with a different symbol. They're the black ones, and the yellow are all the bullets. So you can see there's a lot, if this was one of the defense positions, you can see there's a lot of bullets going up toward that direction, which should be expected. So right now, the outer circle on this is what I'm proposing as the site limits for the battleground. We've got a real steep drop off over here, and then here's that big gully that they could not cross with the wagons. And if I had it to do this all over again, I would have swung on out like this a little bit more. Because if they were shooting from over here toward uh, warriors hiding in this ditch, any overshot would have gone into this bank on the other side of the uh, ravine and be recorded over here. So we need to do a little more work over here. So next proposal is to continue out in here. You can see here the whole area. Um, I might add here that this area over here will be the area of the area talked about in the next go around here. And then as a caveat, if you go out doing metal detector surveys on transects and hope to keep your site location unknown and not available to the public, don't do it a month before Google updates their aerial photography. You can see every transect we made. So,
It's kind of fun. As I say, we've got enough problems with people wanting to be out there looking for that stuff anyhow. So, in ending, I'd like to acknowledge all these people who either worked for us or in some way have helped out on the project. Um, and so, I guess I can take some questions. <laughs>